Hi everyone and welcome back to my OWASP series on top 10. I'm really sorry it took so long to record this third video. Uh, the reason was actually quite simple. I was going to record the video pretty much straight after video two and then realized that actually trying to get cross-site scripting to occur in .NET is actually quite difficult because .NET has lots of cross-site scripting protection built in. So in the end, I realized I needed to uh, create something in PHP where it'd be a lot easier to demonstrate what cross-site scripting is, how it works, how to stop it. So what is cross-site scripting? It's the most common uh, vulnerability for web applications, but most people really don't understand what it is. But effectively, what you're doing is you're running some kind of active content. So we're usually talking about a script, but nowadays, of course, there, there are times we can use web sockets and other kinds of funny data connections. But usually we're talking about running a script within someone else's page. Now, the problem with that happening is when something runs within someone else's page, then the victim, the, the end user, is going to end up trusting what's happening because what they see is a URL, a valid URL to a valid page, let's say, you know, Facebook or Google or somebody like that. So the user trusts the page and when they see something running inside, it may be asking for their password or email address or something like that, then they're much more likely to trust what the attacker is trying to do. So the attacker can simply send a link to a victim and when the victim clicks on the link, it opens a real site which they trust, but by doing something which we're gonna see in a minute, then that link has been compromised and is actually running something that is under the control of the attacker. So how common is it? Well, OWASP say that cross-site scripting, uh, which is called XSS, and I guess that's so that people don't get confused with cascading style sheets, which we usually call CSS. So XSS is supposedly the most prevalent web application security flaw. So it's the most common, but also the good news is it's one of the easiest things to fix. And why is it so common? And I don't really know. I'm guessing it's possibly a hangover from the days when security wasn't taken seriously. Uh, web applications were really just designed to get data from the user, store it in the database, and then echo that information back out to the user at some later date. Um, and the other thing is that it can be quite interesting. The vulnerable web application is in most cases just a vehicle to attack the user. So you're really using the trust that the user gives to that particular site in order to launch the attack. But of course the attack might also be against that web application ultimately. So if for instance, you manage to put cross-site scripting into let's say Facebook, then somebody um, trusts Facebook and you might then ask them to enter their Facebook username and password as an attacker you take that, send that away to your own website and you're actually attacking Facebook ultimately. So the vulnerable website might or might not be the direct target, but it is being used by the attacker to build that kind of trust. So let's actually look at what this um, looks like. I've got one of my uh, demo sites. I use this for uh, teaching about Yi2, which is a PHP framework. The principles are exactly the same across all frameworks and all languages. The difference is some frameworks have uh, cross-site scripting protection built in. Some of them might have it available, but it's not enabled by default. So that's up to you to sort all of that out. But what I've added is I've added, and this is really just a very, very crude, sorry, I've got the URL wrong. A very crude example of, uh, sorry, it's post, not posts. Very crude example of how cross-site scripting works. So let's imagine for a second that this uh, is a site, that like a blogging site, I guess, and you can create a post, let's say something like Reddit, and you wanna kind of add a comment to one of the posts. So you hit create post, you got a little form here, you kind of put your name in, and you say, yeah, this is my content, whatever. And you hit create, and then that's fantastic. Uh, this is the post. I've shown here just a, a little unordered list, which basically echoes back 
the you know the stuff that I've typed in. So that's all fine. And the problem with a lot of web app application development is the developer might stop at this point and basically say this works. This does what I want it to do. If I click on this, it will show me the lists of the posts. It's all great. It works, doesn't it? But of course, when we're looking at security, we have to actually ask what happens if somebody misuses this site. So let's look at a, a basic kind of reflected cross-site scripting attack. So there are two forms of cross-site scripting. They basically do the same thing. It's just the attack vector might be slightly different. So let's create a post and this time rather than typing in what we're expected to type in let's type in this uh, script instead now this script is literally just a normal script like you type into an HTML page but I'm pointing to another domain so notice this is u2.test I'm pointing this to jt.local it's another local web server on my machine and I've put a little test JavaScript in there and I'm going to put some more content don't really care what it is that's fine now when I hit create you notice that it's actually going to run that script um, now why is it running that script well if I actually view let's view the source here if I look at this then assuming this is going to show me it effectively as soon as the browser sees that text even though it was supposed to be somebody's username the browser thinks it's just a script because it looks like a script. It's all the right syntax. It's going to load that script and it's going to do what that script says. Now, like I say, all that script actually does, I'll just show you quickly, is it just sends an alert. But obviously this script could do lots and lots of bad stuff. It could manipulate the page it's loaded into. Um, it, you know, it can send data, it can read data. It can kind of do all sorts of damage. So that's really kind of bad news. Um, and that's what we call a, a reflected one. You've put data in, it's come straight back to the end user. The other variation is called a stored cross-site scripting attack. Now, in a sense, what I've just shown you is both, because if I look in here, you'll notice that um, the data here is stored exactly in the format I typed it in, which is the bad format. So if I go in and view this post again, then it's going to run the script again. Uh, and the reason why stored uh, cross-site scripting attacks can be quite serious is because it, it can allow the attacker to perhaps submit that data on a completely different page. You know, maybe they submit something over here, and then when you actually go then to the post index page or the view page or whatever, that might be when the script gets executed. So being able to store it in the database and show it at a later date both gives you that kind of wider attack vector. But also, if you think about it, if I look at this um, this link, uh, the view one here, and if I right click and copy the link address, let's say I send this to you know somebody else to to my victim as a link, and they look at it and they go, oh, this is okay because I, I trust this site, u2.test, yeah, that's great. So I'm going to click on this link, I'm going to go there, and bang, you're running an attacker script, but you're running it with all of the trust of the site. And again, the user, um, you know, they're not normally going to see a script, they're normally going to see perhaps a little box come up here saying, please re-enter your login details or something like that. But basically, you can kind of do whatever the script can do. As you can imagine, that's a lot of really bad stuff. So that's what a cross-site scripting looks like. There's lots of different ways people can upload scripts, but by and large, um, the, the way I showed you here, when we create a new one and we just type stuff in, that's fairly commonly doable. Um, and uh, the other thing is though, people might use uh, escaped characters. So again, if you're gonna be validating your input, you can't just say, oh, well, let's swap a, you know, a, a triangle bracket for a code because maybe they're gonna type two triangle brackets or you know, maybe they're gonna use some kind of code that when your code runs, turns into a triangle bracket. So you've gotta be really, really careful um, and that's kind of uh, where we are with that. But if we then say, how do we fix it? So this is a serious stuff, it's the commonest vulnerability. It's very, very easy to fix it. And really is a combination of three things. 
Validation means that we're not going to let people type anything into the input. They're going to have to type certain characters that, that are allowed um, and we're going to block anything else. Now validation is great. Uh, we'll show you, let's show you what that looks like. So let's um, go back to our, uh, which one, our uh, view page? No, not the view page. I want the, the form one, which is where we actually edit it. So um, in here, I can kind of go, well, let's actually validate this. Let's go into the uh, model itself and let's actually put a regular expression on um, the username. So now what I'm going to say here with this regular expression, and again, this is just an example. Yours could be whatever it needs to be. I can say um, that it's basically going to be A to Z or spaces. That's all I'm going to allow uh, in that field. So that's a, a pretty easy fix. Validation is dead easy. And, you know, we can hit create post. Now, what happens when I want to type a script? It says you can't. Your name's invalid. Um, you know, you're not coming in. If I try and create, it's not just not going to let, let it happen. So that's fantastic. That's really easy. Um, another thing kind of related to validation, you know, not, not being funny, is actually you know, restricting the length of stuff as well. So if you're, if you want a username or, or, you know, a person's name, does it really need to be a hundred characters long? Because what happens now is, you know, even if um, I don't have any dodgy characters, if I, you know, start typing in something too long, it's going to actually restrict it. And that, you know, means that I can't actually even type that because even that would be too long. So straight away, I'm limiting what an attacker can do just with some really, really basic validation. But of course, you might have spotted it already. There is a problem with just using validation. The problem is, what's going to happen with this content? So at the minute, I mean, I've actually got it, uh, where am I, form, as a text input. But really, that should really be a text area. So let's F5 that page. So, you know, really, this is a blog post. It can have all kinds of stuff. I might be saying, oh, yeah, the answer is to use script. So, you know, straight away, my validation is going to, mm, I've kind of got to let him use triangle brackets. And, and of course, this might actually be that whole string that we typed in here um, might be the, you know, the answer in the blog post. So all of a sudden, my validation kind of goes out the window. I can't restrict the length because, again, this is a big blog post, rich text, all kinds of stuff. Probably... I can't really do very much about that. I've got a problem, and if I type in the script in here, um, the you know again exactly the same thing will happen. I've got a cross-site scripting attack, but that one seems harder to know what to do. So as well as um, validation, the second thing that we use is encoding, and we're talking here specifically about HTML encoding the data that comes back to the web browser. So rather than sending something that looks like a script, which the browser is going to run, we change triangle brackets in, into HTML entities so that what comes back, the browser says, ah, this isn't an actual script. This is just text, which happens to look like a script. Now, your framework will do it 100 different ways. Most frameworks have a method that you can call. You could call uh, HTML encode. So here, rather than just squirting, you know, model post data, um, I can use, if I've got it here, I have HTML, um, HTML, uh, colon, colon, encode. Um, what content do I want? I want my model post data. Da -da 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 -da. Right, I think... That should work. So now if I view it again, all I've done here is made one really simple change and said, I'm going to HTML encode it. And by doing that, it's every time this function sees things like triangle brackets, then it's going to replace them with an HTML code. So all of a sudden the browser doesn't see that as a script. Now, if you inspect it um, very unhelpfully, it looks like it's come through in exactly the same way. So that's a little bit misleading. If you view the source of the page, however, you'll see what it actually looks like, uh, wherever it is. Or is that all? Oh, sorry, have I gone past it? Uh, where are we? Uh, yeah, so here, if 
that triangle bracket has become ampersand lt semicolon which is just the html code for a left hand bracket so you see all of this stuff here has been encoded so that even to the human eye obviously that doesn't look like a script tag anymore to us but the browser rather cleverly is going to then say you know i know actually how to draw an ampersand lt semicolon and it looks like this the quotes are encoded the other triangle brackets so validation and encoding are, are by far your two best friends uh, and this kind of reveals another thing that's quite important about web application security and that is use the built-in controls i mean there's a detail view widget in the case of ye and if i run that it does it all automatically for me so what that means is i don't have to remember to encode the data because I'm going to use a built-in widget that I know does it automatically. Or I need to make sure I've got a code review checklist so that when I'm submitting my new page, one of the questions is, have you HTML encoded all of the data that's coming out on this page? Um, you know, you can decide whether to encode data that you've um, typed in yourself. Um, you might not want to do that. But again, ask the question, code review checklist, have I encoded the data? Or can I use a built-in widget instead so that I don't need to remember to encode it, but the widget will encode it for me? So really, they're the two really big tools. They're the two easy ones, validation, encoding. In fact, validation is uh, a protection against SQL injection, other types of injection. So you kind of just need to do it. There's no excuse. Every web application, intranet, um, public internet, whatever it is, validate your input get 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 into the habit of doing it in this case the validation goes in the model class um, you can use a match pattern you can use a type you can tell it it's an integer you can tell it it's a decimal um, in the case of ye and in uh, .NET you do it in a different way you can put a validation as a data attribute on the model in web forms you can use a regex validator you can do all kinds of stuff but you just need to get into the habit if you want to write secure code of validating all of your inputs so they're the two main ones the other one I want to mention just before I finish is something called content security policy now content security policy is very simply a header that gets passed back from the server to the browser that tells the browser what it can and can't run in terms of other domains so a content security policy can define things like where can I get my fonts from, where am I allowed to run scripts from, uh, data content, images, all kinds of stuff. So your, your content security, security policy could be quite long, but in this simple case, I'm going to show you um, one really kind of quick, dirty example. So let's go back to um, to this. Let's uh, put put back in the broken stuff so that we can actually see um, the script running. So that's fine. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So let's just make sure that that um, is broken again. If I run that, oh, did that not, did I not save it? What's going on? No, I didn't save it. Right, so you can see here the cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability is present now the important thing here is clearly the attacker is going to be on a different domain to this website uh, if the script is on the same website as this then we've got other problems but in pretty much all cases the attacker's domain of his script is a different domain so content security policy allows us to say you can't run scripts from any other domains or you could say you can run scripts from google and from jquery and from my own um, cdns but you can't run them from anywhere else uh, and the header basically looks like this if we go into the controller here so this is just the PHP header function. And again, you wouldn't normally do it like this. You would normally do it globally somewhere. Um, even in the, um, you could do it in the web server itself. In .NET, you could do it in web config. There's kind of lots of different ways to do it. But effectively, you're sending this header back to the browser. And in this case, I'm only talking about scripts. Um, again, like I say, it could be talking about fonts and you know, objects and videos and all kinds of stuff. But just to, to show you a simple example, what I'm saying here is the only scripts that you're allowed to run 
or the source of the scripts is self. In other words, only scripts that come from u2.test are allowed to be run. Um, there are other options for telling it to allow inline scripts uh, and um, whether you're allowed to run eval, which can be a dangerous function um, for JavaScript. So again, you can disable that. It's, just, it's those kinds of things. Hopefully you can see that's you know, fairly straightforward. So what happens now is if I now reload this page again, you notice it still comes up broken because the data itself is broken, but notice it didn't run the JavaScript. If I do it again, it doesn't run the JavaScript. If I bring up the developer tools, ignoring the uh, inline script errors, which have happened because I've not allowed inline script, but notice here this line, refuse to load jt.local testscript.js because it violates the following content security policy directive. So that's really cool because we're getting the browser to do some work here. The browser is going to say, yet yeah, the policy says I should only be running scripts from self. So this is a way, it's kind of belt and braces. You should be validating anyway. You should be encoding anyway. But hey, why don't we make a policy about it just to be really, really clear about what can and can't run. Um, and this is especially useful if you're the kind of person who does scary stuff with JavaScript and you build it dynamically and you do all kinds of horrible things, then the content security policy might actually be your best um, security control. But in this case, we're adding it just as another layer of security to say, do you know what? Even if everything else fails, the browser's still going to stop that script from running because of the content security policy. So that's that really. Um, hopefully that's fairly straightforward. The problem hopefully is fairly obvious. Like I say, the two big things, validation and encoding. And the third thing, which is a nice little addition, is the content security policy. But hopefully that explains everything you need to know about cross-site scripting, which is OWASP vulnerability um, number A3. If you've got any questions or comments, please put them at the bottom on the video, on the, the YouTube comments. Otherwise, I'll try and get ready and do uh, the remainder of the videos really soon. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.